Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have... Karen Heenan. Yes, we do. It was so fun. It was really good. And uh, Karen's a historical fiction author and Mm -hmm. she, um, she had some kind of special experience because she was with a small press. And Mm -hmm. so she has experience there. And we talked a a lot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Different path than people we talked to lately. So that's very interesting. And she had some really good thoughts on, um, like building a backlist, like the, I just like the way she thought about it. Mm-hmm, me too. And me um, too. yeah, we talked about validation, like mm-hmm. traditional publishing, indie publishing, and where you can find your validation you, yeah, and control mm-hmm. for yeah, us indie could, authors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I talked that a lot. I know. So uh, we have a month, a new sponsor this month, and uh, we are going to talk about them real quick because we love them so much. Yes, yes, it is a book funnel. Yes. and if you're interested in book funnel, you can go to bookfunnel.com/slash/wikt hyphen podcast. Yes. And if you do that, you can get fifty dollars off the yearly fee for new accounts, excluding the first time author plan. Yeah, uh, which is only twenty dollars a month or twenty dollars yeah. a year. We love Book Funnel, and we're just so excited they're a, a sponsor, so we can talk about them a little bit more. Yes. Um, yeah. We they're, already talk about them all the time, but we do love them. We love they're them. Like, we love Damon and his wife, and, and they just run such a great company, and they're mm-hmm. they're very author-focused. That's what I love mm-hmm. about them. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Damon they, is an author, and yes. that's kind of how the whole thing started. Yep. He wanted to send an ebook to his mom. And he couldn't figure out how to do it easily. He was like, oh, there's no system. And Mm -hmm. he has a programming and computer background. And he looked around and was like, oh, I think I could make something that would make this easier. Right. And so so it's it's made it just so nice for the author community. It's it has. It really has. So let's tell people what book funnel is for for those people living under a rock and don't know (laughs) what book funnel is. Let's tell them what what it is. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks. <laughs> so I cannot describe how it happens. All I can say is that if you use Book Funnel, it will help you get your books to readers and they don't have to sideload books. Right. So like if right. you want to give a freebie away, you can give them a link and say, here, click this link and they will be able to get their book on their Kindle yes. Sony reader. If anybody still yes. has those or whatever, they work on all the things. So um, yeah, so it just makes it so much simpler. And they handle customer service. We don't have to, like if anybody has trouble, you can just send them to Book Funnel and Book Funnel takes care of it and helps them get their books so that yep. you're not doing, um, helping them find their books on their devices and stuff. Right. So right. it's a huge time saver. Yeah, it is. And, you know, the great thing about, especially if you're a new author, um, it just makes you feel like someone has your back. I remember yeah. thinking that maybe that's because I knew Damon, but yeah, but I just felt like somebody had my back that because there was so much of this business I didn't know, but I can I knew that if I sent people that link, they were going to get their book or they were going to yes. get their promo or whatever it was that I was sending out, they were going to get it. And um I didn't have to worry about that. And I love that about Book Funnel. So yeah. thank you yeah. guys for sponsoring us this yes. month. We we really appreciate it. And we'll have that link in our show notes. Yeah. So I'll just say it one more time. It's bookfunnel.com slash W-I-K-T dash podcast. Mm-hmm. And we just are so thankful to have them as a sponsor. And we don't have any new supporters this month but or yeah. this week. But we're so thankful for the supporters that we oh, do yeah. have. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I don't really have much news just writing little bit here and there and reading through this thing that I have written and I've sort of gotten to the point that the wheels came off. So I am, uh, it's slow going because I'm like, Oh yeah, now I know why I stopped writing on this, but <laughs> because the wheels fell off, but, uh, prior to this, it was pretty funny. So I'm, I'm thinking, so you will get there. It's just, yeah, just going to take there. 
yeah. some like we talk about this, like sometimes you have to go back and figure out where things went wrong and then like patch it back together. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, what for me, you? um, I spent a couple of days packing up the books that I have. I had all the paperbacks come in. I had about half the hardcovers come in. So mm. I spent a couple of days packing and, uh, going to the post office and stuff. Okay. So, so I am near the end. I'm almost done. I just have to get that last shipment in and send those things out. And then I think everything will be fulfilled. And, um, I'm at the point where I'm like, Oh, this was great. I love this. And I was thinking the other day, like when I was, when the, the Kickstarter ended and I was getting in all the orders and uh -huh. there was the glitch with the ordering. And I was like, I really had a couple of days where I was like, I just don't know if I'm cut out for direct sales. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was just, I think like, like, and it's all on you. I think that's yeah. the deal is like, you yeah. don't have any backup and you've got to figure it out. You don't have book funnel there to help you. I know. I know. <laughs> so maybe Damon will have some <laughs> customer service <laughs> for yeah. direct sales. Yeah. I mean, they do, they backed me up with the fulfillment yeah. for the eBooks and the audiobooks, So that yeah. was great. But like it was when I was having some issues with the checkout in the Shopify yeah. store, yeah. but we got it all fixed and it's all done. And so now I'm, you know, feeling much better about things, mm -hmm. but I thought mm -hmm. I should say that the, there are moments when I'm like, oh, this is just, Too it's much. just a lot. And it's yeah. like, oh, I don't know if it's going to actually work out and it all has worked out. So if you're in the middle That's of great. it, just keep going because right. it, you will get to the end. I heard something, uh. I guess it was last week. I saw something, of course, you know, if I say I heard it, read it or saw it, it's from TikTok. So take that <laughs> okay. for, for what you will. But uh, it was something about, you know, when things, when you're stressed and when you think this can, you know, this is just a mess or whatever, mm -hmm. no matter what it is, if you stop and think and say out loud, but what if it works out? Mm -hmm. It changes the way you think. It's so weird. And I've been doing that. And I can't tell you how different I am looking at things because, you know, I can spiral real fast. Yeah. I probably hold the world record for spiraling. Yeah, I was going to say, we kind of specialize in that. Yeah. Especially people and, like me who are like oh, high yeah. intellectual, you know, yeah. like yeah. it's like I can figure out all the horrible things that yeah. can happen really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> but if you just stop and say, but what if it works out? It kind yeah. of changed. It just changes your whole perspective. So anyway, yeah. if you're, if you're struggling with that, you can try yeah. it. If not, you know, you look on TikTok, see what you find. Uh, <laughs> <and> so, <laughs> if nothing else, there'll be something that'll make it'll you be smile. Entertaining. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we should probably yeah. get on with the interview because it was yes. great. Yes. All right. So here is Karen. Well, today we're really happy to talk with Karen Heenan. How are you, Karen? Good. How are you? We are great. We are happy you're here. I am happy to be here. Awesome. Yeah. So let me read your bio and we'll get into the questions. As an only child, Karen learned early that boredom was the enemy. Shortly after she discovered perpetual motion and has rarely been seen since holding still since. She lives just outside Philadelphia where she grows much of her own food and wow. makes her own clothes. She is accompanied in her quest for self-sufficiency by a very patient husband and an ever-changing number of cats. One constant she is always writing her next book. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. I love that. So do you live out in the country or do you no, live? No, we're, we're in the suburbs. It's about six miles from Philadelphia, but it feels like a really small town. Uh -huh. I knew more people here within weeks of moving in than I did in all my years in the city. Oh, well, there, yeah. Interesting. yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, tell us how you got into writing. We'll start there. Oh, uh, well. I was raised by a mother who read constantly and a father who really couldn't read well. My dad was much older than my mom. He left school when he was in sixth grade to help support mm. his family. Mm. So he could read, but not comfortably. Mm. Whereas my mother was usually so deep in a book that if I came to get her, I would get, you know, talk to the hand, come back when the <laughs> chapter is over, unless you're bleeding. Right, so, right, right. I had the storyteller who didn't read, and I had the reader who rarely looked up, and I wanted to know what was in those books. Yeah, It made them so fascinating. I learned right. to read really young, and as soon as I did, my dad stepped back and said, oh, good, now you should practice and learn to read to me. So I started reading National Geographic's to him when he got home from work. So that was a really 
I think even as a little kid, I understood that there was a lot of world outside of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. You know, reading about all these strange places that my dad, who'd never traveled, was fascinated by. Right, right. That's great. And then you just started writing from there? or Pretty much. I started writing in early grade school because Uh I... I read all the time and, you know, I didn't realize it was basically fan fiction. If I wasn't happy with the ending of a book, I would write a new ending. (laughs) Or I would want to find out what happened to the secondary characters because I was more interested in them. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's so funny. That's a lot of writers have gotten their start that way. Yeah. It's a very uh, dissatisfaction can uh, bring out the writers in us, I guess. I can do it better. Kind yeah. of thinking. <laughs> that that's actually what finally pushed me to get out of my own way in query was reading a couple of books in a row where I just looked at them and went, I can do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> and then said, Well, then maybe you should try instead yeah. of just sitting on your books forever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of like how you came to writing and kind of your path to indie publishing eventually, I think. So, but let's talk about now, like, what do you wish you'd known about writing or craft? Oh, um, I think so much of what I've learned later after getting into publishing was just not to be so precious with my words. Mm. There are always going to be more words. You know, when I when I first got an agent and she suggested some changes to my manuscript, you know, it it was full like hand to forehead, stagger back from shock. You want me to change a word? The smelling (laughs) sauce. Yes. Oh, I had to pick myself up (laughs) off the floor. I did it because I wanted the book published. But (laughs) after after that whole process was over and we can go into my agent experience if you want. But after that whole process was over. I looked at it later and realized I hadn't made anywhere near as many changes as I should have. And Mm. if I had gotten a publisher at that point, the editor would have just torn it to shreds and I wouldn't have survived the process. Right. I'm a lot thicker skinned with myself these days. Right. Right. Yeah. I always say that I couldn't have started this journey because I started late in life. I couldn't have started it one day sooner because I did not, my skin was not thick enough for that. And, uh, but I, and I don't know why when it happened, it was okay. But I, I look back now and think, oh my gosh, some of the things that have been said about my work, some of the things that I've said or thought about my work, there's no (laughs) way I could have survived that. So, yeah. No, and I started late too because I hadn't I hadn't really been writing with thoughts of publication. It was yeah. just something mm-hmm. I had always done for myself that I yeah. loved. Mm-hmm. And I worked for lawyers for 30 years and writing was what I did when I got home from work so that mm-hmm. I could get it all out and not right. go to work the next day and think about punching somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Not good to punch your boss, <laughs> no, especially no. when they're lawyers. Yeah, exactly. And one day it just came to me that, you know, I was I had gone from doing it to myself to hiding behind it mm-hmm. and I needed to get mm-hmm. out of my way and see if it was as good or as bad as I thought it might be. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, what's your definition of success? Oh, the eternal moving goalpost. <laughs> yes. That one. <laughs> that one. <laughs> um, I tend to always have like several goals in mind because there's, you know, There's the big goal, which is making a living off my writing. But if I have that one as the only goal in mind and I don't hit it, I'm going to feel like I'm not doing anything. So I have like stair step goals to get there. Right. But right now, my main goal is really building the kind of backlist that I would be able to make an actual living off of. And Mm -hmm. I'm now six books in. Right. Um, Books. There's a seventh book, if you count the omnibus of the first trilogy, and mm-hmm. the new one that I just released is the end of a second trilogy, so that will get bound up together. Mm-hmm. So it's really, I guess success is just really being able to write the books that I want and put them out in a way that, you know, I am proud of the work that I'm doing, and I'm slowly but surely gathering an audience that appreciates the work. That's great. 
Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that you um, have that perspective because yeah, we always all want to make a living, but we, it, that is a, um, an ever moving target. It really is. (laughs) And I, my, my goal is not six figures, though. I would be happy if someone would throw that kind of money at me, Mm -hmm. but my goal is enough. Yeah. Enough to, you know, my husband and I, we're not expensive, extravagant people, though. I am going to Vegas next month for 20 books. Yes. Um, First vacation since before the pandemic. Oh, if you wow. can call 20 books a vacation, and I'm not sure you can. No. <laughs> um, but it's a working vacation, right? It, it is. is a working <laughs> and vacation. I actually volunteered my husband for the AV team. So it's a working vacation for yeah. him, too. Yeah. Well, I love the way you said you're thinking you want to build a backlist to make a living mm-hmm. off of. And mm-hmm. I don't know anybody if anybody's ever described it quite that way on the podcast, mm-hmm. but I really like that because it's like it gives you that perspective that you're trying to create this back catalog mm-hmm. instead of like just being focused on, oh, I have to get the next book out. But like if you're building a catalog, that's a different way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. And it also takes a lot of responsibility off the next release to be a huge success. Right, Each one right. builds off the next. And my last release came out on October 18th. And with every, you know, the world is basically on fire. Mm. And it felt really icky to be out there throwing confetti in the air and saying, hey, I've got a book released when there are innocent people on, yeah. in every country suffering who knows mm. what. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, I did I did kind of the minimum, but the book is there for the people who know about it. And I will continue to write. I'm already into the next one somehow, even though I said I was going to take a break. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, no, it is hard navigating that um, because honestly, for the last three years, the world's been on fire. Yeah. So it's like or three and a half years. I mean, <sighs> It's kind of hard to know where that line is. It that keeps moving too. And, it does. And um, I don't think the fires are ever going to go out. There's no. Being, as 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 a, as a rate as a as a human race, we're not learning a whole lot about how to no. put fires out. We just no. keep lighting more. Yeah. Right. And you know, I think writing and putting stories out in the world is one of the few positive things we can do. Right. Even if we can't throw a party about it, we're still right. doing something yeah. that's not negative. Right. right. Yeah. I I remember I, I was yeah. I was writing after 9-11 and I remember I kind of went into this almost not like a deep depression, but like a, like what am I doing with my wife my life? Yeah. There's all this stuff going on. I'm worried about these fictional characters. Yeah. But then I came around to realize that that that, that provides an escape for people. Like mm-hmm. all this horrible stuff is going on. And mm-hmm. sometimes you need that fictional escape for a few hours. Yeah. And you know, we can give that to people. And maybe we don't throw a big, huge launch party to talk about the book, but we can say, hey, if you need a, an escape from this crazy world, mm-hmm. come over here where it's nice and safe for a couple mm-hmm. hours. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that can be, it is difficult to navigate, though. It, it is, is. But look at the way we all fell into books and Netflix at the beginning mm-hmm. of the pandemic. We yeah. needed to escape into stories. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah, we sure did. Yeah. Well, let's talk about marketing since we're talking about marketing anyway. Um, <laughs> what do you wish you'd known about marketing? That I would have to do this much of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yep. even, I, I mean, I would have assumed being a self-published author that I would have to. But mm-hmm. when I first, you know, started with this, I started querying traditionally. And I just assumed that a publisher would just, you know, take my wonderful shining book out of my hands, polish it a little bit, and then make sure everybody knew about it. And right. That's not how it works. Even if you're a big name with a big five publisher, they still yeah. want you out there mm-hmm. doing doing the dog and pony show with the book. And honestly, if I'm going to work that hard, I want all the results. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, I understand that. Yeah. We, we've said that a lot on this show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I was just on a podcast and, um, um, oh no, it was the thing we did, the webinar we did, Sarah, yeah. where somebody was asking about, had we traditional ever queried or indie. and yeah, yeah, traditional or indie. And I'm like, I've drank the Kool-Aid. Mm-hmm. I'm not, <laughs> I am dyed in the wool. 
indie published. I think um, if I had known a little bit more when I started out, I would have gone that way too, because I was an only child. I like mm. my toys my way. Ah, you know, yeah. I, I like being involved in all the pieces. <laughs> Don't I, touch my things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> there is That's a lot funny. of, yeah, a lot of people who really enjoy indie publishing. We like the control of mm-hmm. the being able to control the different aspects of our book and publishing. So yeah, Even that's if a we're huge hiring factor. somebody to do certain things. We're choosing who and what they do. And yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Well, what do you wish you'd known? Uh, I mean, what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career and looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? Oh, I guess the first assumption was despite everything I'd heard that, you know, querying wasn't going to be that difficult. Mm, I yeah. got 86 rejections before I got an agent. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I I counted them up again recently and it, mm-hmm. I was off by one it, before mm-hmm. I thought it was 85. Right. Um, I got an agent. Um, she shopped my book around for about a year, didn't mm-hmm. get any bites on it. And we parted ways. And I think at that point, I was still a little thin skinned because I stepped away from it for like a year and a half and just went, you know, if a professional couldn't sell it, then, you know, I shouldn't even be trying. And Mm. it was it was probably a time when I wouldn't have been focusing as much on writing anyway. We were um, my husband and I had recently gotten married and we were thinking about moving and there was a lot going on and I had just Mm -hmm. stopped working full-time to try to build uh, one of my other ways of staying out of a cubicle. Um, I have a handmade business where I work with a lot of uh, upcycled fabrics and I was trying to Mm -hmm. make a thing out of that. And I just sort of put the writing to one side for a little while until one day I was just, we, we moved out here to the burbs and it was quiet. And all of a sudden, the voices in my head came back. Mm. And one of them said, you know, there's a scene in that book that you shelved that is completely wrong. And Mm. I had no idea where that voice came from because I hadn't thought about that book since like 2016. And it was 2018 now. Right. And I pulled it up and read it. And the voice in my head was right. And I fixed that one scene. And then I went through it and did the rip and tear edit that I should have done before, but I didn't have the distance, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was debating then whether I wanted to start the process of querying over again. Mm -hmm. And that was when I ran across a pitch event on Twitter and ended up going with a small press. So the long way around there is one of the things that I guess I wish I'd known was how many ways there were to approach publishing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, is, there are lots of different varieties, even though we tend to be very like, you must go one way or the other, mm-hmm. you know, traditional or indie, there's lots of like steps in between that you can do. And yeah. I've, I've tried a few of them now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, tell us about the 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 pitch, how you got yeah. your agent, because that's an interesting mm-hmm. story. Um, well, they I don't know if they still do this particular competition, but also I think Twitter, they do. And yeah. Twitter is not what Twitter was. So no. who knows yeah. by the time it happens again. Um, I was on Twitter in December of 2018, and I saw all these like really brief like query tweets and I'm like looking at it and it was something called pit mad and I looked it up mm-hmm. and it was a you know pitch your book on Twitter in 180 characters uh with a couple of hashtags and the only people who were supposed to like your tweets were either agents or small or like publishers mm-hmm. and I looked at that and thought that was an interesting idea mm-hmm. and I should try that sometime but I'm not you know query letters are harder to write than entire books yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. So I've heard that. I'm yeah. like, I'm not even going to try to put my book into 180 characters. Mm-hmm. And I walked away and went upstairs and did some sewing and came downstairs, picked up my phone, typed out a 180 character thing, said, oh, the heck with it, hit send, and then walked away again. And when I looked at my phone again that night, because I actually ignored it for like eight hours. Because I was afraid of what it would say. 
I don't think I was afraid of that big fat zero. <laughs> I had likes from two agents and a small press. Oh, wow. wow. And so I followed up on all of their random instructions. I sent one agent the two chapters that she wanted. Um, I still haven't heard back from her, so I'm taking that as a no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other agent wanted like 50 pages. Mm -hmm. She liked it, but she wanted to know, since it was a Tudor historical, mm -hmm. um, would I be willing to rewrite it more in the voice of a very successful author who writes in that period? Mm -hmm. And I turned her down. Yeah. Because yeah. I'd read a lot of that author's work. Um, she's very good at what she does. She's not writing the same kind of books that I wanted to write. Right. And I also thought that if I started out trying to sound like somebody else, I would have to keep going. And yeah. yes, that could I be exhausting, to, right? It would. And I wanted to become, you know, I wanted to deepen my own voice, not masquerade right. as somebody else's. Right. And the small press read the first three chapters then they read the full and they basically took it on with minor edits mm. and then asked me did I have another book in mind and I'm like um not really <laughs> and they're like well this might make a nice series and I'm like but I finished the main character story I'm done yeah. with her yeah and I thought about it and went but there are some secondary characters who could yeah. So that's how my Tudor series happened was there. It's a series of linked standalones. Yeah. Okay. They hand off to the next character at the end. So there are three of those. And actually, I've just gone back to that and started book four. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So we should tell people you write historical. Historical. Romance, uh, historical, it, historical fiction. fiction. Some okay. of it has romance. I mean, there's yeah. romance in it because most lives have some. Sure, but it's sure. not specifically romance. So it's historical fiction. Yeah. yeah. And it's I've got two trilogies. One of them is set in Tudor England, and the characters are all ordinary people in proximity to power. I got oh. tired of the kings and queens, and how many times can we tell the story of Anne Boleyn? Right. So mm -hmm. it's a, a royal minstrel in the first book. The second book is... Um, it's a male main character. He works for Cromwell. And the third one goes into Queen Elizabeth, and it's a minor lady in waiting. Oh, okay. And my recent series is based in Philadelphia during the Great Depression because I grew up with my dad and my aunt's stories about it. And the books are not my family stories, but they are the world that my family stories built in my head. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was right. a really fun experience, like learning my own hometown, but by looking for what was left from that period and you know what buildings are still there but what was in them you know almost 100 years ago right. wow that's i love been, that that's been it's fun. not my family story but it's the stories that they, they sort of they built that world in my yeah. head i mean bits yeah. and pieces of it mm -hmm. but not any of the main characters are oh. things i learned yeah i love that. yeah it's a good yeah. description of how we take it is. Uh, things that are around us and kind of incorporated in. It's not necessarily like cold, hard facts, but it's right. like the atmosphere of and it. Certain certain family details I didn't even realize had made it into the books because I <laughs> twisted them around so much that I didn't recognize them mm -hmm. and then looked at it later. And I'm like, oh, OK, that's <laughs> that's so and so didn't yeah. catch that. <laughs> yeah, That's funny. That's funny. Yeah. Well, what's the most important lesson you've learned? Ah, uh, to stop like pushing against the way my can do we do Cl we do Clifton strengths here? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Everybody all, take a drink. All, everybody yeah. drink. Yeah. Yeah. Um, basically to understand that the way my brain works is the most functional way for it and to stop trying to become an outliner and to become more organized in certain ways. You know, I know, I know what works best for my brain. And every time I try to do what someone else tells me is going to work, it ends up, you know, yeah. I won't say putting me into a writer's block because I don't really, that doesn't really happen. Block to me is like something went sideways and I need to go back until I find the place where the story went wrong. Right. But when I try to follow somebody else's rules for how I should work, it just never works. It stops me dead and makes me doubt what I'm doing. Right. 
So I think that is really the, is, you know, learn how your mind works and how you work best with it and to stop fighting it. Right. That's really And great. accept it, right? It's yeah. like, mm-hmm. this is the way I am. Like for me, it's like, okay, I'm going to have to think about this for a while before I can write this scene. And that's yeah, really yeah. hard sometimes because you just want to press forward sometimes, but it sometimes is, you don't know what my, you're going to write. My, for me. my top three are input, learner, and intellection. Mm. So I just you absorb sound like Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the hamster wheel is just constantly running <laughs> in the back of my head. <laughs> but I it, totally understand that. It, it makes me, you know, it's one of the things that makes me resist the, you know, writers have to write every day. Mm-hmm. Well, it depends on your definition of writing. My definition of writing is taking a walk and letting my characters yell at each other. Yeah. And sort out what the next scene is going to be. And then I can come home and maybe do something. Mm -hmm. But if I just sat down and tried to produce that, it would be like pulling teeth. Mm -hmm. It it comes when it's ready and it comes a lot faster if I don't push it. Right. Right. Which is so odd because you'd feel like once you Mm -hmm. stop trying to figure it out, sometimes that's when your brain unlocks it for you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, um. So you told us you were working with a small press. Now, how was that experience? I think I know, but tell our (laughs) readers how that experience was. And then what you did on the back end of that. Okay. It was, um, it was a really good experience to Mm -hmm. begin with. And I mean, Mm -hmm. even at the end, it wasn't a bad experience. What I found out was that it wasn't a, for me experience. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. They were a good group of people. They did really nice jobs with editing, but it was a fairly new press. Mm. And I think we were all learning. Right. But because I will take a walk and listen to four or five writing podcasts back to back until Mm -hmm. I can't walk anymore. Mm -hmm. I was constantly making them crazy with, well, what if we tried this? And have you tried that? And (laughs) did you ask Amazon for more categories? And uh, I I think at some point they probably would have liked to have blocked my email, except that I was, you know, one of their writers and they had to, you know, deal with me. Yeah. Um, But we worked together for, um, Songbird in a Wider World, my first two books. And we were into the pandemic at that point. And I was working on the third book of the series. And it just, I just kept coming back to, you know, I'm at home. I'm, okay. you know, it's just me and my husband and the cats. And right. I have all this time to focus on this book. And I really, really wanted to see what I can do with this. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'd, I'd already spoken to them um, about the 1930s books, which I thought was one book. And I said, you know, when we were talking about doing a contract for the third book, I said, I want to write in an exception for this 1930s book because it's very personal to me. Mm-hmm. And I want to just do that one start to finish myself. Right. So I'd already had it in mind by then that I wanted to self-publish. Right. but. Yeah. Then when we got to the point of sending in book three, I ended up emailing one of them and saying, can we have a call? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I just I really. Kind of of, of the writer's variation of that. It's not you, it's me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I said, you know, it's been a really good experience, but I think we're going in different directions and they actually were publishing a lot more fantasy Uh, and I said you know I I'm beginning to feel like I'm the odd one out and Mm -hmm. it would be easier for you to focus on one genre and it also you know I would if I'm with a publisher and it's a small press I'd like to be able to promote the other authors but I don't feel like we have the same audience so Mm -hmm. it's sort of a wasted effort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they were actually really good about it oh that's and you know um i asked for my rights back and it happened relatively quickly really you know i mean it took a while to for it to trickle back out of all the channels that had Mm -hmm. been put into Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know i still live in fear that kdp is going to (laughs) find me on some site where i don't know i exist yeah 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 but Once I got everything back, I um, did just a quick glance over 
you know, because there's always the one or two typos they get passed. And I yeah. did a little tiny cleanup. I didn't have to put new covers on the books because if we're talking about the only child control freak, my first book had a different cover when it came out. Mm. And I wasn't particularly happy with it at the time. Yeah. But that was sort of we'd gotten to it was the best we were going to get. Mm -hmm. And then after it had been out for a few months, I was talking to a writer friend and she said, you know, if you're not happy, you should talk to my cover designer and just see what he comes up with. Mm -hmm. And he came up with something I really loved and I bought it and I sent it to the publisher and said, I'd really appreciate it if you'd slap this on the book and see if it sells better. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they, there was silence for a couple of days and then they're like, well, it is a really nice cover. We'll try it. And the sales went up. Oh, so wow. I just, yeah. when it came time for book two, I just commissioned the cover myself and sent it to them. Oh, so good. at least when I got the books back, I had to do some tidying up of the interior files, but I owned those covers. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Make That's that a smart. lot simpler yeah. than the road. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think I was preparing myself for the inevitable self-publishing even before I knew it. Right. Mm -hmm. I just kept taking pieces of it back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. I just never released the third book to them and said, no, I'm just going to do this one myself. That's yeah. great. Yeah, that's great. And so it was a clean break. It was. And, that's you know, good. I still I still talk to them on social media. It's a perfectly mm -hmm. pleasant clean break, mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. which is also that's nice. Yeah, yeah, that is. That's great. Yeah. yeah, I think that's something for people to think about. Um, if they're going to go with the small press one, sometimes they're easier to work with. Yes, they know. really were. Um but on the other hand, it's still a publisher. It's still mm -hmm. somebody else making decisions about your book and your the the front facing uh, experience of your book and and the interior of your book. And so, you know, you have to weigh those things against each other. And it it it's right up there again with accepting how you work best. Right. I. Right. They were not a bad experience. It right. was a bad experience for me because I don't fit in that kind of a structure very right. well. Right. Yeah. Right. And you didn't really understand that probably no. at the time. Yeah. No, I, when I, I, I hadn't really spent too much time listening to Joanna Penn's podcast by the time I discovered them. I was still thinking self-publishing was, you know, what you did if you couldn't get published. Yeah. And I learned that was wrong really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Half, halfway through the process of book one, I was kind of like, oh, I could have done this, but mm -hmm. no, I've got a publisher. It still at that time felt like validation. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I've come to realize that the validation that's necessary is readers. Yeah. It's not a publisher or an editor or anything or an agent it's the people yeah. who read the books right. they're the, all the validation i need that's 100 percent how i feel i and mean why I just, does it take I love this that, long to get uh, there <laughs> well you know it's really funny because for me um i was like oh no I'm publishing this myself, but then was kind of thrown into a situation where I had to pitch my, or I didn't have to, I chose to pitch my book um, to two fairly large uh, publishers. And they, I mean, at the same time, and they loved it. I mean, they were laughing. They were just all there. They want, I mean, they were fighting with each other, you know, play fighting. I'm, I want this book. No, I want this book. And I'm thinking, well, maybe mm -hmm. I should think about traditional publishing. This feels pretty good, you know. But then they, as soon as I thought that to myself, they stopped and one said, did you say he's a rock star? Yeah, you'd have to change that because rock stars don't sell. And is he a lawyer in the second one? Oh, yeah. No, lawyers don't sell either. You'd need to change that. And then they started telling me all these things that were like, basic and primal to the story so what like they is, like that I, exactly <laughs> i'm like you like how i told this story you don't necessarily look like this story i mean it was just the fundamentals of the story that they wanted changed and i was like mm -hmm. oh no 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 yeah, no, like, I mean, like there was something that rose up inside me that just almost <laughs> screamed, no, you cannot have my story. Yes. But I mean, I was nice, but yeah, no, it, it's 
it's always strange when they see something that fundamental and just that's not going to work. Right. Um, what my one a lot of the uh, rejections I got from my first book when I was still querying agents was that the sample was good. They liked the writing, but you know, Tudor historicals were tired, mm. and you know that's going to be out. Of, that's by the time it would get picked up, it would be yeah. out of fashion. Yeah, and I'm like, for people who like a certain era, it's yeah. never out of fashion. Yeah, and never. also, the Tudor yeah. series was still on Showtime at that point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, the people who like it are never going to not read right. books yeah, set right. in that era. Right. Yeah, one thing I've learned about traditional publishing is like, if they have, like, if the publisher has a book of a certain type they don't want to take on another one because they don't want to compete with that book. Mm -hmm. A lot of times mm -hmm. there's the, Oh, we already have a 1920s series or we already have yes. a world war two, blah, blah, blah. Although that seems so hot right now. I think you could have like 15 of those on your list. and It would be fine. But readers but, can yeah, read readers so don't think like that. We can ever write. Yeah. 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 And reader it's completely different when you think about it from the reader point of view. Right. So, yeah. And I, th but I think that's the, I think that's one of the primary differences between indie publishing and traditional publishing. I could be wrong, but mindset. we have, it's mindset and we mm -hmm. have our fingers on the pulse of the readers because we are, we are directly linked to the readers. We are interacting mm -hmm. with them. Their pulse is more on the sales. They look at the sales. They're not looking at readers mm -hmm. because right. there is, there is separation between them and the readers. And I think that that's why there's a difference in thinking. I mean, of course, we think about sales too. I mean, the, yeah, but, but we also but, are but, the readers. We but are if the we readers. We see something too. that's doing well, like if Tudor's doing well or whatever, yeah. we don't think, oh, we can't do any more in that. We think no. maybe I could write something if, similar that would be in that genre. To it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can. How about we writing can, to market? Yeah. We can run ads targeting. Yes. You know, comp authors. Yes. You know, yeah. oh, if you like this, you'll like mine. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, again, I don't put down um, traditional public. I mean, there's a place for it for sure. It's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. Does it have problems? Yes. I think to well, me, there are fundamental yeah. problems with it. Yeah. But if that's what the road you choose to take, that's great. That's the wonderful thing about. Mm -hmm indie publishing yeah. is you can do whatever you want. If mm -hmm. you want, uh, you know, publishing in general these days is you can do whatever you want. You can pursue that path of traditional publishing. For me, I was older. I didn't have time to go back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. And I just didn't want to. I, I didn't want that. I think I had had my limit of rejection and, mm -hmm. and criticism by that point too. And I was like, well, I don't know if I can take any more. So that was yeah. also a comment I got was, well, you're a little older for a debut author. Well, who cares? Well, yeah. Like readers are going, oh, I can't um, read this person. Yeah. <laughs> readers are not How old care. are they? Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I never read anyone over 30. Right. Says that. I think they assumed that if I was successful, they wouldn't be able to get as many books out of me oh, because well. I was 50 plus. <laughs> you day, <did>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have said that. How much time do I, do I have left? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, that's that, funny. It's like women always have some kind of a ticking clock. Don't yes. We? Oh I just didn't gosh. think it had anything to do with writing. I did. I. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. Well, this has been super, super fun. Um, tell us what you think the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success has been. Probably the just the ability to be flexible and to pivot when something doesn't work to, yes. you know, maybe take a minute to, you know, freeze in terror and figure out yeah. what went wrong, but <laughs> then to just go on and try the next thing. My, my plans yeah. always have backup plans. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And great. my books always have backup books. If one doesn't work, there's going to be another one. Mm -hmm. And, you mm -hmm. know, I, I don't know, I don't know where I got this one, but it's like, a book is always a new book to a reader who's never read it before. Right. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm so fixed on like just building backlist because I want to, when somebody discovers me, mm -hmm. I want them to go, Oh, she's got five more books. Right. Right. You mm -hmm. know, yeah. instead of just focusing on making one perfect and having somebody read it and maybe fall in love with it and go, Oh, but there's nothing else. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. 
I love that. Yes, that's terrific. I love that. Well, tell everyone where they can find you and your books. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, my books are, my paperbacks are everywhere. Right now, my eBooks are on Kindle Unlimited, so they are Amazon exclusive. Okay. Because I've found a good sized audience there. So I'm working with it until it doesn't work anymore. (laughs) I've got um, audiobooks for the first two in my tutor series, and I'm working on the third. Okay. I'm producing those with some actor friends. I started doing Ooh. that during the pandemic when they were unemployed. <laughs> Perfect. And yeah. Learning all about that technology. Uh-huh. Um, and I am on all the social medias under Karen Heenan, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or X, Blue Sky, Threads. But uh, my website is karenheenan.com. And anybody who wants to sign up for my newsletter there will get a prequel novella for my 1930 series. And if they can wait until they've read their way through, there's also an epilogue. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been fun. Yeah, it's been great to talk to you. So we'll have all those links at uh, wishiknownthen.com. And you can support the podcast there if you want to. And thanks to Alexa Larberg for editing and producing the podcast and to Adriel Wiggins for doing the admin. And don't forget about our sponsor for this month, Book Funnel. You can find them at bookfunnel.com slash W-I-K-T dash podcast. And that's it. We'll see everybody next week. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.